Hey everybody, I wanted to share my love for Anchor. If you are interested in making your own podcast, let me tell you that Anchor has been a lifesaver for Cindy and I when we're putting together our show. First of all, it's free and it has creation tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. Now you can add any song from Spotify directly to your episodes. The possibilities are endless for what you can create, whether it's music analysis, your own radio show, or something the world's never heard before. Anchor will distribute your podcast for you so it can be heard on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and many more. You can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. It's everything you need to make a podcast in one place. Download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Trust me, this is the way to go if you're ready to start your own podcast. Welcome back to part two of the 70th episode of It Wasn't Me, a true crime podcast where we chat about murder. I am Cindy. And I'm Mercedes. Thanks for listening to last week's episode to part one of the Morehouse Murders. Forewarning, our show is often horrifying and graphic, and we do use offensive language. So if you have kids, put them away for a while and join us for a murder. Also, we are passionate and always have been about true crime, but I have to warn you that we might make jokes and laugh during this podcast. Want to learn more about us? Visit our website at itwasn'tmetruecrime.com to find links to our social media pages. We drop a new episode every Friday morning. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast on your favorite platform so you don't miss out. Thanks for listening. And if you're even slightly entertained by our Southern charm, leave us a five-star rating along with a comment. If not, reach out to us and let us know how we can improve. Also spread the word and recommend our podcast to your friends and family and even maybe your enemies. Yeah. How's it going, Cindy? It's, it's, it's going. The week's almost over. Yes. I'm excited. (laughs) The week is almost over. It's Thursday. Trash goes out by the road tonight. I need to tell my boys that, but yeah. Yeah. Otherwise. I am looking forward to this long weekend. Yes. Yes. Tomorrow yeah. is our, my baby is no longer a middle schooler after tomorrow. Uh, your baby isn't going to be in high school next year. Oh, yes. it's the beginning of so many wonderful emotions. <laughs> yeah. I really <laughs> kind of am. I mean, you know, Kobe just turned 20 uh, last week, last Saturday. And it's really nice having my two youngest still at home, but they're Mm -hmm. as young adults because mama doesn't have to worry about cooking. I don't need to worry about getting them up for, you know, I'm just enjoying it. Mm -hmm. Kind of the empty nest before they're like really fly. That's right. Oh, so I have to ask, did he, did he want to go to his, his usual restaurant for his birthday? Yes, he did. (laughs) Uh He has the number 14, the enchiladas <laughs> special, the specialis. Yeah, so That's my funny. home course. Uh, every year since he was three, we've been going. He picks oh my that gosh. Yeah, Wow. Every year. Every year. <laughs> and I'm like, wait, no. Wow. Yeah, but, All right. So are you ready? I am, some- but hey, you know what? We, we always ask our listeners, you know, yes. if, if they have a problem with us to contact us. <laughs> Um, or to contact us, even if you don't have a problem, we have been getting some contacts. Yay. Yay. Um, so we wanted to reach out and say thank you to Jennifer S for contacting us about episode 39. We appreciate you. Thank you. And I am composing an email to you. I will get that out to you this weekend. Yes. All right. So we will get that accomplished after our busy week. (laughs) (laughs) I need to breathe. All right. Tell us, what do you have? Okay. Oh, you're going to finish your story from last week. I am uh, going to finish the Morehouse murders. Okay. And, and can you just quickly, can you just give me a rundown? Because I feel like that was forever ago. <laughs> yes. So the Morehouse murders are a couple in Australia that I covered two of their murders, two, two of the murders last week. Yes. Two of the murders last week and how the, they were taking young women back to their house and sexually abusing them, raping them, chaining them to a bed, and then taking them to a, like a state park and murdering them and burying them in a shallow grave. So I left off with two saying we weren't finished yet, but before I get to continue on with the murders, you had asked me about their 
criminal past and maybe why they went to jail before. And I did find some more information. Okay. Like I was saying, I did find a little bit more information about David and Catherine's criminal past prior to the murders. So remember I told you that David was an apprentice jockey at a horse track. Okay. Yeah. But he, he was fired because he broke into an elderly woman's home and he sexually assaulted her. Um, this particular article that I found was that he robbed, assaulted an elderly owner of a boarding, ho- a boarding house. And it also says that Catherine found a friend in David Burney. She would do anything that he desired because she, she was like really kind of lonely and unhappy and depressed. And the, the actual like horse trainer at the racetrack said that David Burney was really kind of like skinny and sickly and just pale well, kind of I person. know that jockeys, I know, well, in the United States, do, mm-hmm. do you know that they have to weigh exactly 125 pounds? Now, this is a Kentucky Derby because I just watched it the other day. No but less than no more? Weigh, they can't weigh less. They cannot weigh more. So if they weigh less, then they have to wear, they have to put on shoes or clothing or weights or something so that they weigh 125 pounds. I did not know that. Hmm. I just learned that. Well, that's interesting. Didn't know that. All right. Well, so he was fired because of this assault. All right. And Catherine would do, huh? Did he go to jail? Okay. I'm getting there. Oh, sorry. He would do anything that he desired. And together they went on a criminal rampage that would land them both in jail. Okay. On June 11th, 1969, David and Catherine pled guilty in Perth police court to 11 charges of breaking and breaking and entering stealing goods worth nearly three thousand dollars the court was told that Catherine was pregnant with an with another man's baby um they admitted to stealing I don't know how to say that word oxyacetylene okay thank you oxyacetylene equipment I don't know what that means hmm well and Sounds using like it to try to oh oh, oh wait acid and using or something it to try to crack a safe at the Waverly Drive-In Theater. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. What that sounds like like maybe some sort of mm, I don't know. I don't I'll know. look it like up while you go on. Sounds like a chemical to me, <laughs> or a chemical, or like some sort of torch. I mean, oh maybe yeah, maybe it is some sort like a like a blowtorch type thing to try to like burn. I don't know. Gas welding, yes. Oh, there you it's, go. Uh, it's yeah, it's like a torch. Yep. So Catherine was placed on probation and David was sent um, to jail for nine months. Then on July 9th, 1969, they were on trial in this on the Supreme Court on eight further charges of breaking, entering, and stealing. They pleaded guilty. David was um, already had three years of imprisonment added. He had three years of jail time added to his current sentence. And she was put on probation for four more years. Then on June 21st, 1970, David broke out of jail, teamed up with Catherine again, and they went and they were apprehended, apprehended less than a month later. And they were charged on 53 counts of stealing, receiving um, stolen goods, breaking and entering being unlawfully on premises, unlawfully driving motor vehicles, unlawfully using vehicles. In their possession, police found clothing, wigs, bedding, radios, food, books, 100 sticks of... Sounds like dynamite. Yeah. Probably dynamite. 120 detonators and three fuses. Catherine admitted that she knew that she had done wrong, but that she loved David so much that there was nothing she wouldn't do for him. And she, if she would get her chance to prove that in the years uh-huh. to come. Okay, so all of these crimes, they're not doing any sexual crimes that we know of, or they're at least not being charged with any of those at the time. So, so far, I know, I mean, these are kind of, um, I mean, they're crimes against people, but they're not violent crimes against people. Correct. So David was sentenced to two and a half years in prison. Catherine received six months. Remember how she said she was, she was pregnant? Well, her Mm -hmm. newborn baby was taken from her by welfare workers and held until her release. Not sure why they wouldn't have handed him over to the father, but I know why now, because this is before she got married. Okay. So out of prison a few months later and away from, remember how I told you that this would give her an opportunity to be away from David and Mm -hmm. the the parole person asked her to, um, recommended that she go work for this family as their live-in domestic 
Oh my God. Or nanny or whatever. Oh Lord. So um, the article says for the first time in her life, the scrawny young woman seemed to have found happiness. David McLaughlin, or Donald. not David, Donald <laughs> McLaughlin, the son of the family where she worked, fell in love with, and then married on May 31st, 1972, which was also her 21st birthday, shortly after she gave birth to their first, the first of their six children. They named the baby boy, little Donnie, after his father. Seven months later, Donnie was killed when he was crushed to death by a car in front of his mother. Fast forward, psychiatrists would later ponder the significance of this tragedy tragedy in the horrors of the future. If I watched a car crush my kid, yeah, I'd be fucking batshit crazy. We left off with me telling you that this murderous couple was not finished. Are you ready for more? Oh, I don't know. Uh, I'm about to give it to you. Get ready. Okay. <laughs> On November 1st, these truly depraved people saw a 31-year-old Noeline, Noeline, or Noeline, Noeline Patterson Noeline. standing beside her car on Canny Highway. She had run out of gas while on her way home from her job, where she was a bar manager at a um, at like a golf club. Thinking that these good Samaritans were stopping to help, she got into their vehicle. Once inside. She had an, a knife to her throat, just like the rest of them seemed to. She was tied up and told not to move. She was taken back to Morehouse Street, where David Burney repeatedly raped her after she was gagged and chained to that damn bed. They had originally decided to murder her that same night, but David kept her prisoner in the house for three days, and there were signs that he was developing emotional feelings for her. Okay, so I have to back up the truck for just a minute, all mm -hmm. right? Because what happened to Donald? Well, she left him. She, she left, left him with her six mm -hmm. kids. Okay, you did tell yeah. us this last week. I did. So yes. just like, I'm sorry, my brain okay. is like marshmallow right now. <laughs> okay, okay, all right. So he's starting to have feelings for her. All right. So she's developing, or not she, he's developing feelings apparently for the were the victim and Catherine is not super excited about this. She was quick to notice this emotional connection and became very jealous and issued an ultimatum stating that David would have to kill the victim or she would kill herself. Okay. So you, wait, you said that day she told David you kill Nolene or I'm going to kill her myself. No. Or she's going to kill, kill herself. She's going to commit. Catherine's going to kill herself. Okay, she's going to commit suicide. She's going to commit suicide. Oh. There you go. That sounds better. All right. He immediately forced an overdose of sleeping pills down the throat of Nolene and strangled her while she slept. So he loved her enough or was codependent enough to, to do that for Catherine. Mm -hmm. It says immediately forced an overdose of sleeping pills. So I'm assuming this means enough to overdose, but then as soon as she fell asleep, he just choked her. So there was... To me, there was no overdose here. So there's no know. struggle or anything. It's just easy to strangle her. She's not right. fighting back or anything. Oh, so they Lord. took her body to the forest, buried along with the others. So on November 5th, the Bernies abducted 21-year-old Denise Brown as she waited for a bus on Sterling, Sterling Highway. She accepted a ride from the Bernies. I wouldn't call it accepted because it says accepted a ride from them at knife point. That's not really accepting the ride. That's yeah. being kidnapped. Yes. Forced into the vehicle. Strong armed. Not really. Yeah, sure. Yeah. That's. Mm. Denise was taken to the Morehouse residence again, like the rest of them, chained to that damn bed again and raped. The following afternoon, she was taken to Wanneroo Pine Plantation, which is a different location than the others. And I'm wondering what was the sudden prompt in a different location? So safely in the seclusion of the forest, David raped her again in the car while the couple waited for darkness. Okay. I mean, I guess he's just like, oh, I'm bored. Let me just rape her here in the car. As they dragged the woman from the car, David assaulted her again and plunged a knife into her neck while he was raping her. Jeez. Again, I hate these people. Convinced that the girl was dead, they, they dug a shallow grave and put her body in it. But Brown sat up like sat straight up and David Bernie then grabbed an ax and struck her twice at full force on the skull with it before burying her body in the grave. Did I mention I hate these people? So, I mean, they're shallow graves. So they're taking like shovels and stuff like that. 
Mm-hmm. Oh my God. What is I wrong know. with these people? I know it's, it's terrible. It's absolutely disgusting. So on November 10th, 1986, their next victim, which their next victim was 17 year old Kate. Is that more? That's Mior, more. Mior, Mior? Yeah. Okay. More. Abducted at knife point by the cup, by a couple, which is them who had taken, um, they took her back to their house, chained her a bit to the bed and David repeatedly raped her while Catherine watched. The next morning, David went to work. Catherine unchained, her name is Kate. So Catherine unchained Kate and forced her to call her parents and to say that she had spent the night with her friend. I wonder why she did that. She forced her to call her parents and to say that she was at a friend's house and that she was okay. And I did read in another article that she actually told her parents that she had gone out and had been drinking and that her parents knew something was up because their daughter, they knew that she didn't drink. And that that was like a red flag. So that when she called, they knew whatever she told them, like they knew something was just not right. I'm yeah. just curious why. I mean, was it maybe to stop the them from contacting the police? I think so. Yeah. Okay. After placing the call, Catherine then led her back to the bedroom and left her there to answer the door in order to make a drug deal. Oh my God. But she didn't bother to secure Kate back to the bed. She didn't chain her back to the bed. So let me tell you. I love this girl. This is when she made a run for it. She escaped out a window by breaking the lock. She fell out of the window and and hit her head on the concrete as she was escaping. And she went to various neighbors' doors and was like banging on the door. And then when she jumped a fence, she was attacked by David's damn dog. What, his dog chased her? It just said like she jumped a fence. So I guess maybe she was knocking on doors and didn't know how to escape. And then she jumped a fence and she jumped back in his backyard. And oh my, was, oh hell no. I know. But she was That's able. Become, okay, so is she clothed at this point? Does she have uh, clothes? She is. I don't put it in my slides here, but she she is clothed. She run, so after she's gone to these houses and apparently people aren't answering the door, they're not there or whatever, she runs to a store and into a, like, it says naked, but later she says that she had on leggings and I think like maybe like a tank top or something. But this says she ran naked, hysterical and weeping into a store. She stated that she was raped and needed the police. When the police arrived, they were initially skeptical of her story, but this amazing girl was able to tell them the fucking phone number and the address of the couple who abducted her. I wonder how she knew the phone number. I don't know. And I couldn't find that out. Well, you know, they used to write it on the phone. Remember this was 1986, right? Yes. Like in the middle, I remember, I clearly remember it was like one of those dial phones. Yes. A rotary phone was the, was uh, the push button phones, but you would write your number or your number would be in that little plastic. Yes. Yes. So that's probably the phone number and the address. That is amazing. The address. So when the police are kind of skeptical, she was, she gave them all these details and she said, Oh yeah, well, I know the phone number and I know the address. So when Kate, um, when Kate and the police arrived at the Bernie's residence, Catherine admitted that she recognized the girl, but refused to answer any more questions about her husband. Now that's what it says there, but later you'll hear me tell you that she denies ever knowing the girl. So Kate would later state um, that she asked them if they intended to kill her or rape her and was informed, we'll only rape you if you're good. Oh my God. Yeah. So I don't know if that means like they're like the, they're being sadistic or if they're saying we won't kill you, we'll only rape you if you're good. Not like as in a, oh, okay. You see what I'm saying? Oh These people okay. are making me sick to my stomach right now. Oh yeah. She was forced to dance for them and she was forced to sleep in the couple's bed, handcuffed to David. Oh my God. Poor yeah. Child. The Bernies had given themselves aliases. However, this badass remembered David's name because she saw it on a prescription bottle. Oh my God. She is an amazing witness. Mm -hmm. She would tell the police that they watched Rocky on VHS and that she even drew a picture in a concealed area of the house as proof of her presence there. Okay. Wait, she was, she was 
I used to listen to a podcast and they call on Murderinos. Murderinos. She was a Murderino before her time, before everyone's time. All this crime, true. I bet she watched true crime stuff, or even in the eighties, she was paying attention. She. she was I mean, I'm wondering if she's like from you know a police family or something because it's kind of like she knew. Mm-hmm. She knew what to do. So police would find the drawing in the house and they would find the VHS tape in the, of Rocky in the, in the VCR. David and Catherine were clearly arrested. And during their interviews, they gave conflicting information. This is where I tell you that Catherine denied ever meeting Kate, while David insisted that she had come over voluntarily to engage in consensual sex. And another article said that she came over to smoke a bong with them. The police tried to trick them into confessing to the crimes like after intense interrogation. And then Detective Sergeant Vince Kadich said in a jokingly manner to David, okay, it's getting dark. Best we take the shovel and dig them up. And David replied, okay, there are four of them. Whoa. Yep. And the Bernies were reportedly very excited, even proud to show the police the location of the graves of their four victims. Hmm. Yeah, that's a special kind of fucked up. When told of her lover's confession, Catherine also then broke and confessed. They agreed to take the police to the bodies um, that were buried not far from the city. It was, though, as if it was a load off of David's mind, he spoke freely. I'm sorry. I'm I'm sorry. Can I interrupt you for just a second? So there are four other women gone and buried. Mm -hmm. Was there any sort of like um, police looking? Was there any sort of investigation where they missing there I mean, were a little they, bit and i do touch on that a little bit kind of do. in a little okay. yeah in a okay second. so because were they looking for obviously when they when kate got out did they suspect that maybe the disappearances were related mm, they get there yeah okay so they agreed to take po- Oh, no, no, no. I'm sorry. I don't know if i mentioned that or not so i'm not sure if they were kind of connecting the dots at that point or not Okay. Until, but this is only five right days after the first one. So, yeah. but they're all taken from the same area. Mm-hmm. So they, uh, like I said, they agreed to take the police to the bodies that were not far from the city. Um, it was as though it was a load off David's mind. He spoke freely with the detectives as he directed the convoy of vehicles out of the metropolitan area and toward the state forest north of the city. The con, um, the convoy moved along Wanneroo, Wanneroo Road through the pine forest. So that makes me think that maybe it is the same forest, pine like state forest, maybe just called two different things because one, I don't know, because along that same road. You know how the articles are. Sometimes they're well, yeah, and you know who knows. Maybe they're just afraid to go back over that way. They don't know if well, mm-hmm. who knows. So Bernie was so relaxed and chatting so much that they were almost at Yenchip before he realized. Um, that's probably not how you say that. Before he realized they'd gone too far and instructed them to turn around. Squinting into the darkness, he recognized a track that led them off the highway into the pine plantation about 400 yards into the forest um, david instructed them to stop he pointed at a mound and said dig there within minutes police uncovered the corpse of denise karen brown who had been reportedly missing for um only five days earlier with a guard placed around the shallow grave bernie directed the convoy south to the Glen eagle picnic area uh, on albany albany highway after traveling for half an hour Bernie guided police into the forest along a narrow track and up climb about 40 yards from the track, police uncovered the decomposing body of 22 year old Mary Nielsen, who had gone missing on October 6th. So it is in two different locations that clears it up for me. But in the same general area, it is, it's in the same general area. um, You know, maybe 30, 20 to 30 minutes apart or whatever. Another, um, I didn't translate this one into non-metric. I forget what we call it here. What do we call it here? miles no I, know, no I know that but we call it the um is it the imperial system and not metric we call it something i forget i don't know a further kilometer down the track david pointed out the burial site of 15 year old susanna can candy who hadn't been seen since october 19th Jeez. sergeant Kadich was amazed that neither of the bernies showed any emotion or embarrassment while the bodies were being uncovered if anything they appeared to enjoy being the center of attention 
as they pointed out the graves to the police. Catherine Burney said that it was her turn at this point. She would like to indicate the position of the next grave. Like, ooh, 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 my turn. Me, pick me, pick me. That's what I, I think of when I read that. She pointed out that it was where they buried 31-year-old Noeline Patterson, who they had kidnapped and murdered on October 30th. Catherine went to great lengths to explain to police how she disliked this victim from the moment that she and David had abducted her. She was glad that she was dead. And she pointed out, um, she pointed out the grave of the police and spit on it. She showed a great deal of pride in being able to find the grave unassisted. And it was as if she didn't want David to get all the credit. Well, and she's still harboring resentment towards this poor girl or woman. Right. And as I left the burial ground, David commented to Kadich, what a pointless loss of young life. What? Is that yeah. because he, oh God. That's the one he was, had an emotional That's who he connection. Liked. Yes. There was absolutely no doubt in the detective's mind that if the young woman hadn't escaped earlier that day, I mean, this is, they, this, she got away. They confessed. They found the bodies all on the same day. The killings would have kept, would have gone on and on and on psychiatrist attached to the case agreed that Catherine could not have killed on her own. She just wasn't that type of person. But the quiet mother of six was totally obsessed with David Burney and would do anything, including murder for him. Yeah. I'm, but what I'm wondering, okay, so Kate gets out of the house. Mm -hmm. She gets away. Does mm -hmm. Catherine not know this? Is she not going, oh, what am I going to do? I mean, she I opened the door like, to oh, the well. police. Yeah. Like, oh, well, she got away. Or, I mean, maybe she's so wrapped up in her drug deal that she didn't realize it. I mean, it doesn't tell me how long this took. I mean, I'm assuming it took, you know, a little bit of time for her to run around the neighborhood, get attacked by a dog, get away from the dog, run into this grocery store or um, whatever type of store it was, talk to the manager, the owner, and say, I've been raped. I need the police right now for the police to finally show up. The police questioner, they kind of are like, eh, are you sure? And then she goes on the whole rundown. Hey, let me tell you where these motherfuckers live. And then they finally show up with the police. So this probably took a considerable amount of time. So what Catherine was doing during this considerable amount of time, I have no idea. I don't know if she was like, well, fuck it. Um, she got away. Or if she was panicking and not knowing, you know, there weren't cell phones in 1986. So it wasn't like she was calling up her hubby saying, uh oh, she got away. Well, I mean, no, but they had landlines. Yeah. And he worked at a junkyard. So, she, she, I mean, I don't know. So they're saying that she wasn't the type of person who could kill on her own, but she was prepared to murder for him, like, like uh, assisted with him. Um, she was even prepared to take her own life. When he got too far with one of the victims, remember the cat, it says Catherine turned the knife on herself and said she would rather die by her own hand than see him fall in love with someone else. God, this just makes me sick. So there's also speculation that there's disappear that he is the like suspect and other murders, uh -huh. the disappearance of Cheryl Renwick, May, 1986, Barbara Western, June, 1986, and has been suggested that he's responsible for the disappearance of Lisa Marie Mott in 1980. However, his first wife accounted for his whereabouts during that person's disappearance. Here I go with my opinion again. <laughs> but I mean, okay, so what kind of mental state would you be in to be that open to your man? I don't know, having pleasure with another woman at that other woman's pain and you're watching it. Yeah, I don't know. I don't even know is what that, you would call that. Is that, yes. So it's, it's definitely, even if she's not, if she's meek and mild when he's not around, it's still, I don't know. I don't know even what I'm trying to say, but I, I don't understand any of it. I don't either. I mean, well, I kind of understand like, you know, the, I've, I've definitely studied like the mind of the rapist and the different types of rapists and mm -hmm. they sicken me. But I think that her role in it is, is, is even more deplorable because of the fact that she should be trying to protect the women. Right. And I, I feel the same way. So David would plead guilty to four counts of murder, one count each of abduction and rape. When asked why he pleaded guilty, he, ju um, he gestured toward the victim's families and said, it's the least I could do. Oh my God. Yeah. What a fucking so, hero. I know. Right? I know. He was sentenced to four terms of life imprisonment after being found sane enough to stand trial, 
Catherine was also sentenced to four terms of life, life imprisonment by the Supreme Court of Western Australia. Under law at the time, both were required to serve 20 years before being eligible for parole. Oh my God. That's it? Right. Because life, I guess, like in our country, life is like 25 years, I believe. And so I guess life is but technically- Is that, okay, you serve 25 for your first count and then you serve the other 25 for your second count and then- Unless it's- Concurrent. Concurrent, yeah. So initially, David was held at a maximum security prison. But he was soon moved to um, solitary confinement to keep him from coming to harm from other prisoners. Because I guess they really just fucking hated him. Well, yeah, the original he's a fucking rapist. Yeah. It says the original death row cells were converted for him and he stayed there until the prison was closed in 1990. So they made a special home for him. The cell can now be the cell can now be viewed on the great escape tour held daily at this prison so i guess it's like a museum while oh, incarcerated <laughs> so you can go travel through this jail and see the cell where this where he lived rapist yep. murderer lived yes yeah uh you know like i'm really into like true crime and telling the stories but i am not into idolizing any fucking murder or rapist no mm -mm. i'm not into going to a museum that glorifies i mean it says it's the great escape museum and I, I mean great escape tour so maybe a lot of people broke out of this prison i did not research great escape and then maybe that's just part of the tour yeah oh, but sure maybe weird. a lot of people did escape maybe we did have a great escape but then you know going down this right and to your left this is where yeah. the you know serial rapist and murderer david Bernie lived and we converted kind of reminds me of that jail that haunted jail in St. Augustine oh, I love that jail <laughs> I love going there that's like, like the my oldest jail part. in the country or something and it's yes haunted. that's always been my favorite part of St. Augustine was yeah. the jail while incarcerated the Bernies exchanged more than 2,600 letters with each other but were never allowed any other forms of contact that's a lot of I'm letters surprised they even loved, I'm surprised they even allowed that honestly so after that prison closed, he was moved to another prison. And on October 7th, 2005, this sorry son of a bitch committed suicide. Oh, God. He hanged himself to death. He was due to appear in court for rape of a fellow prisoner the next day. Okay. So, so like, I mean, it's 100% certain that he committed suicide and it wasn't, you know, like a Jeff Epstein type thing. I mean, I guess so. His... Uh, Official manner of death was suicide by hanging. Catherine is imprisoned in a women's prison, not going to try to say that, where she is the head librarian. Oh, wow. I know. Her first application for parole in 2007 was rejected. Good. And then, I know, right? Oh, darn. The Attorney General of Western Australia, Jim McGitney, said that her release was unlikely while he remained in office. Good. Her case was reviewed again in 2010. However, on March 14th, 2009, the new Western Australian Attorney General, Christian Porter. Oh, and I wrote she later because I thought that said Christina. It's okay. Christian Porter revoked Catherine's non-parole period, making her the second, second Australian woman to have her papers marked never to be released. Woohoo! Good. Hey, freaking men. That's right. Good. Keep her in there. Let her affect people's lives as a head librarian and make that world a better place. She has no business to be free right. at all. Well, <laughs> and she would appeal this decision. Her appeal of this decision would be turned down in March 2010 by that same Christian Porter. Now, if Porter revoked her ability to be released, why on earth would she appeal it? Like that person was going to be like, oh, okay, I changed my mind. I mean, what? Her, I'm sorry. I mean, what is her basis of appeal? I mean, they she just appealed that decision for her never for her I mean, papers. I'm sorry. Well, I mean, and I don't know how the law works in Australia, but I will tell you that to me, she for for the murders of four people and then the rape and and torture of a child of a 17 year old, she should never be free. Why? No, why should she get parole? Exactly. Well, her fourth um, bid for parole was declined in 2016. Good. 
Oh, darn. Now, in 2016, their final victim, Kate, who did, like I told you, she did survive. She began, um, so she started a campaign to end Western Australia's laws that automatically put convicts up for parole every three years. That's awesome. Yeah. Like I said, she's my new favorite person. I'm sorry. She's an adult now because this happened to her when in 1986? Yes. She's 17. So, I mean, she's, she was 17 in 2006 and 1986. So she's about 52 now. Mm -hmm. So she's been fighting this her whole life. Her whole life. In 2017, Bernie's youngest son, Peter, so Catherine's youngest son, Peter, called for her execution. Oh, wow. (laughs) He stated that his association with her has resulted in him being assaulted. Now that to me is incredibly sad and downright pathetic because this poor man now, I said poor boy then, but this poor man had nothing to do with his mother's atrocities. And he also supports Kate's campaign. It's just, you know, the actions of these criminals affect every, it, they, it affects everyone. Everyone. And it's usually their children who suffer the most. It, who, no, it the most is. Trauma. Because they have to put up with that. Oh, your mom's a murderer. Oh, your dad's a rapist. Oh, you know, I mean, I can't imagine. Right. So that's it. That oh is the God. story of the Morehouse murders. I would love to know how you find these things because I'm like, <laughs> oh my God, that was atrocious. I know. Man, I know. these people, God. They're sickos, uh, that's for sure. Yes, ma'am, they sure are. Well, thank you, Cindy. Thanks so much. And thank you all for listening to us again this week. We appreciate sharing our passion with you and we thank you for your support. If you'd like to support us even further, please consider subscribing to our podcast and giving us a five-star rating and a comment. Your subscription and ratings are essential to our success. You can do this on your favorite platform. And for more information and links to our Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter pages, visit our website at itwasn'tmetruecrime.com.